So in the second part of the fifth theme, we will look into the SFA modeling of the Z variables. So I indicated in the previous lesson that uh, the usual approach to model the contextual variables in the SFA literature is to put the Z variables as the, to the inefficiency term. So as we assume that this uh, Z variables influence the uh, distribution of the inefficiency term. And we come to the more specific parameterization shortly. So from the practical point of view, uh, it might be tempting to apply the following kind of two-stage estimation strategy. And this is actually what uh, has been done in the past in several applications. So you might first consider uh, estimating the SFA model and estimate the, the uh, inefficiency terms by by uh, SFA, and then given the inefficiency estimates of the first stage, or, or perhaps you translate them to the efficiency scores, in the second stage you then uh, apply regression analysis to, to estimate the impact of uh, Z variables to the, to the inefficiency U. So now this uh, estimated U in the second stage becomes the dependent variables and you regress it on the Z variables. However, there are several problems, or at least two major problems in this kind of two-stage approach. And uh, you can must first maybe take a little bit time to think about that. What could be the, what could be the problem in this kind of uh, setting? And uh, I will then point out these problems as uh, following the paper by Wang and Schmidt in a Journal of Productivity Analysis in 2002. So firstly, the... One problem is that if that's these uh, z variables correlate with the inputs x, then in the first uh, first stage, because these uh, z variables also influence the, the output, then our um, SFA estimator in the first stage is biased because we have these omitted variables. So because we have omitted those z variables that should be in the model, uh, therefore our our beta coefficients for the inputs would be biased. This is no well-known problem in the in the econometrics known as the omitted variable bias and it's one one of the textbook examples of the endogeneity problem so that's a fairly serious because then if you have a uh, endogenous regression in the first stage then uh, all the statistical properties basically fly out of window uh, it would be better, of course, if, if the Z variables do not correlate with the input. So then, then in that special case, the first stage uh, regression, so if you apply OLS regression uh, to estimate the, the first stage SFA model, then the OLS would be, would be unbiased still. However, because we use this uh, SFA estimator, and if you use particularly this uh, a JLMS estimator for the inefficiency term that introduces another source of bi bias, which uh, Wang and Schmidt called uh, the shrinkage property of the JLMS estimator. And this is something that I already uh, indicated earlier when we discussed about the uh, SFA. So remember that uh, this JLMS estimator is um, trans translating the distance to frontier to, to efficiency. So if even if you have the uh, uh, observation that is uh, located above the production function, then it's anyway has some some degree of inefficiency according to the to the frontier model. So there is this kind of monotonic uh, increasing transformation. And notice that this uh, variation of the of the inefficiency or efficiency score, if you like, uh, uh, the variation is much smaller than the distance to the frontier. And this is exactly what Wang and Schmidt refer to by the shrinkage, that by using this JLMS, we eff effectively then scale uh, this uh, distance to frontier. And because of this, uh, this scaling, uh, even if the Z do not correlate with X variables, the regressing the estimated inefficiency on the Z variable will be biased towards zero. So these arguments indicate that the two-stage estimation strategy is not really a good idea from the econometric point of view. And I come back to this, uh, this same theme again in the context of SFA, where this, uh, sorry, in the context of DEA, where the two-stage estimation remains relatively widely used. 
So what is the remedy in the SFA literature? So of course, naturally, if the two-stage estimation is not a good idea, uh, we can estimate this in one stage or jointly estimate the impacts of uh, Z variables. And usually this is done by maximum likelihood techniques. So earlier I discussed this historical corrected OLS and modified OLS approaches. Uh, perhaps one reason of the popularity of maximum likelihood approach is that um, we can incorporate this uh, additional Z variables to the inefficiency term in the single stage estimation. And uh, in the early 90s, uh, there emerged uh, basically two streams of the uh, parameterizations for the Z variables in the inefficiency term. The first one I refer to as the truncated normal model of inefficiency. Uh, and it goes to back to the works by Subal Kumbakar and colleagues, and there are several other other papers in this uh, this stream. So notice that here I, I follow the notation of Wang and Schmidt, and I, I indicate the truncated normal distribution by n superscript plus. So this means that uh, uh, that uh, we have only positive value, uh, or, or the positive uh, values have a positive density for this uh, truncated normal distribution. So this, uh, uh, you can think about it as the normal distribution, which, uh, which uh, this uh, left tail has been cut away from the zero. But now the mean of this distribution is parameterized so that the, that the Z variables can shift the uh, mean of this truncated distribution. So that, of course, also influences how much of the, how large proportion of this normal distribution is cut away due to the truncation. Uh, another stream of literature that, uh, that uh, emerged also in the early 90s, uh, uh, going back to Reif Schneider and Stevenson's paper, is to model this uh, uh, inefficient, sorry, the Z variables uh, as some kind of scaling, rescaling of the, of the inefficiency distribution. So think about this uh, U asteric as a random inefficiency term that has some some uh, given probability distribution, and then uh, these uh, Z variables are just introducing additional rescaling. So the Z variables can, can rescale this uh, basis distribution, U asteric. Uh, uh, so, so in that sense, these uh, Z variables can influence the expected value, but also the, the variance of the inefficiency term. Um, so the paper by Wang and Schmidt uh, points out several advantages with the models with the scaling properties. So the second approach. So firstly, whether whether we like it or not, the shape of the inefficiency distribution remains the same across all firms. It is just rescaled by the by the z variables. But this allows for a relatively intuitive interpretation for the z variables as marginal effect of z on the on inefficiency u, and of course. Through that, it also influences the uh, output variable. And as the third property, it's also noted that uh, it's possible to estimate this coefficient delta without actually specifying the parametric distribution of this underlying distribution, U asteric, because uh, the conditional expected value of the output, conditional on x's and, and z's, can be stated as the difference between the uh, production function minus the the impact of z variables on the on the uh, expected inefficiency. So remember that mu indicates the expected inefficiency, and mu asteric is then the expected value of this random u asteric. So it's not necessary actually to specify the distribution. We can we can estimate this uh, uh, parameter z. For example, by by just uh, uh, linear regression, if you like, and and actually, this indicates that the model with the scaling property comes actually very close in spirit to this uh, uh, semi-non-parametric uh, modeling approach that I also mentioned in the in the uh, first uh, part of this theme number five, so five A. And uh, this is particularly uh, why I'm much more in favor of the second type of modeling approach because it also has more clear interpretation. So let me also illustrate that why this uh, first type of uh, truncated uh, uh, 
uh, truncated normal distribution approach can also lead to uh, misinterpretations or misunderstandings. So clearly the, the parameters delta in this truncated normal model are much more difficult to interpret. And to illustrate it, uh, let us consider the empirical study by Meon and Weil, who, who applied this kind of truncated normal model to estimate the uh, effect of corruption on uh, economic growth of countries. So this is a macroeconomic level SFA application. They use uh, some, some uh, corrupt, corruption perception indices or similar uh, measures of corruption as a Z variable and uh, economic growth is measured. So you have usual type of uh, value added as, uh, as output and, uh, and labor and capital as input, if I remember correctly. And interestingly, uh, in this study, they found actually that, uh, that according to the SFA model, the corruption actually improves efficiency. And the authors then go on to theorize that, uh, that uh, perhaps corruption can serve as a, as a useful grease on the wheels. So this was kind of, kind of a surprising result to when, when we considered this with my uh, doctoral student at that time, Antti Sastamonen. So we decided to re-examine this, uh, this hypothesis with a similar macroeconomic data. And we used both um, linear regression, SFA, and also we had uh, this uh, non-parametric stoned approach. So interestingly, we found that, that when we look at the uh, residuals, both from linear regression and convex regression, we find that uh, corruption has big impact on the variance of the composite error term. So at that stage, we do not really try to decompose this composite error term to inefficiency and noise. We just notice that uh, corruption actually dramatically increases the variance of the output. And it's, of course, kind of, kind of uh, natural that uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes corrupt, highly corrupt countries can work relatively well, but very often corrupt countries are also, also extremely inefficient. And uh, when we looked at the impact on the level, so you can think about the variance as a, as a, as a, as a uh, distribution around the mean. But if you look at the impact on the mean, there was actually relatively small, but, but still statistically significant and negative effect on the expected growth. So we found that the corruption is not the grease on the wheels, but actually grit on the wheels. And problem with the SFA formulation, however, is that uh, it mixes up this impact on the mean and the variance. So we argue in the paper that actually this estimated coefficient of SFA, it captures the heteroscedasticity effect, which is much bigger than this uh, small but negative impact on the mean. And uh, to see this, I have here reproduced some um, formulas for the, for the truncated normal distribution. So if you look at the impact of the Z variables first on the expected value of the, of the inefficiency term, you also have to take into account that this uh, Z variables also influence the probability of truncation. So it might be very tempting to, uh, to interpret that the Z variables, they only influence the expected value of U. And uh, because this formula is also, also indicator, so there is this symbol omega that looks a little bit like, like, like W. So this omega also depends on these Z variables. And uh, these formulas indicate that also the variance of the inefficiency term is heavily dependent on the, on the Z variables. Okay, so it is wrong to interpret these, uh, these uh, Z variables only as the in, in influence of the, of the Z variables to the to the expected value of inefficiency, they also influence the variance of the inefficiency. And in my view, the difficulty with this parametrization is that uh, we cannot really tell what is, uh, what is driving this result, what is driving these uh, uh, theta parameters in this case. So sorry, this uh, uh, notation slightly changed on this slide. So I earlier indicated these parameters, uh, delta for the coefficients of Z in this uh, paper with anti and we use theta. So these theta are the same, same coefficients as, as delta. The main point I want to make here is that uh, these coefficients of the Z variables, they influence both the 
uh, expected value of inefficiency and also the variance of the inefficiency because of the truncation. So even though we assumed that uh, in this uh, pre-truncated standard deviation is just constant, however, the post-truncation variance is far from constant and it heavily depends on this Z variables. And it seems to me that in this uh, macroeconomic application to countries, uh, corruption actually heavily uh, depend, heavily influences the variance of the composite error term. However, this, this parameterization doesn't allow the separate uh, coefficients for the variance and the mean. So it's tempting to interpret that these coefficients are, are influencing uh, the mean. However, they actually have the influence on the variance. And this is particularly why I, I, I'm worried that this kind of uh, uh, heavily parameterized models can be sometimes very difficult to interpret and can also lead to uh, completely wrong interpretations in empirical applications. And uh, if you want to use the SFA, therefore, I would, I would uh, much more prefer this uh, uh, models with the scaling property rather than this uh, truncated normal model that has this kind of difficulty with the interpretation. So that completes my discussion of the, of the SFA part. And uh, as a next theme, we will go to the modeling of contextual variables in the DEA literature, which is also a fascinating topic. Bye.